There is a story that I want to share with you all today. It is of a, time, it's of a ride, a video clip of a ride from SeaWorld. And so I just want you to imagine that you're perhaps sitting in these roller coaster carts. They look like roller coaster carts, don't they? Um, and watch this video of the fastest, second fastest ride at SeaWorld. The ride is called the Kraken. It is named after the mythological, legendary octopine sea creature that you see in the movie Pirates of the Caribbean. It is labeled Level Extreme. It is the second fastest ride at SeaWorld. It takes you up to speeds of 65 miles per hour, then drops you 13 stories down in a drop. And then it takes you through spiraling camelbacks, a cobra loop, and then through two vertical circles, and then also in a flat spin, all of this coming up to 3.9 G-forces. That's like almost half of a fighter jet. So I'm convinced. See, at Disney, when you go to Disney, they give you rides to just entertain you. It's fun. But at SeaWorld, they make rides to kill you. <laughs> so back when my oldest daughter, Aya, was 12 years old, I went with her on this ride. And there are moments in that ride where I thought for sure I had killed my daughter. <laughs> so now, today, what I'd like for us to consider for a moment is that how life sometimes can be like this crack. It can be like a roller coaster ride. In, in fact, I'm wondering for, if for Abraham, if Mount Moriah where he took his son up to sacrifice him 
was his kraken. And, and that's what it might feel like for us as God takes us through life, right? It may feel like we are in a roller coaster where we're being dropped 13 stories and sent around blind corners at 3.9 G-force. It may feel like the Kraken when you have losses of loved ones in your life. It may feel like this when you hear that diagnosis that you have a disease that you can't cure. It may feel like this as you are trying to struggle through this crazy economy to, to make a living. It might feel like you're on some crazy ride sometimes, even as you are just trying to live in this chaotic world. And for you parents out there, boy, doesn't it feel like we're on a roller coaster sometimes with our kids? So yeah, I can see that life itself can feel like a roller coaster ride. But one thing I want to say today, and pardon my grammar, this ain't no theme park ride. This is Mariah. This is real life. People really get killed here. So check this out. In the passage that we read today from Genesis chapter 22, we've got Abraham up there on Mariah ready to sacrifice his son. And then something happens. It says, he hears the angel of God speaking from heaven saying, do not lay a hand on the boy. This past week, I reached out to some people to ask them, what impression does that statement, that word from heaven, tell them what God is like? When God says, do not lay a hand on the boy, what does that tell you he is like? So as I was up in St. Louis at the seminary this week getting some training to be a mentor, we had a time in chapel, and I spoke to a lady next to me, someone I didn't know, and I just asked her randomly, hey, when you read this, do not lay a hand on the boy, what does that tell you God is like? I will share with you her responses this morning, but before I do that, I wanted to give you an opportunity to also give your impressions. So if you could, take out your sermon note sheet. Actually, you don't have one. Um, sorry. Oh, man. Worked in the first service. Um, if, you, if you could do this for the next 30 seconds, talk to someone next to you and tell them maybe a couple of things that do not lay a hand on the boy tells you about what God is like, okay? So for the next 30 seconds, talk to the person next to you. Tell them what God is like based on what you have just heard from Genesis chapter 22. One, two, three, go. How was that? Good? So I, some, on your way out, share, me, share with me some of your impressions. But I just wanted to, right now, share with you some of the things that this woman I spoke to said, and you can compare your answers to them. But when I asked her, you know, when God says, do not lay a hand on the boy, what does that tell you God is like? Her very first answer was this, God is in charge. Okay, God is in charge, right? Not you, not me, but God. And I really appreciated her, saying, appreciated her saying that because that wasn't one of the things I was actually thinking about. Because like all humans, just like you, I like being in charge. You see, in the world of psychology, they tell you that when 
you are in charge, when you feel like you're in charge, when you make yourself think that you're in charge, you seem to feel like you have some sense of control over the uncertainty or that you can somehow control and make things more predictable. But what happens is that the more we try to be in control, the more we try to take over and be in control, here's what happens. We start to be micromanagers at work. We start to be controlling spouse in our marriage. We start to be helicopter parents in with our kids. And then, listen to this one, sometimes, sometimes we can be helicopter children in caring for our aging adults. That's a real thing. But there are helicopter parents, and then there are bulldozer parents, lawnmower parents, who remove all threats and all dangers from their kids. But when that happens, we become more anxious. We become more worried about things because we think we're God and we are in control. Ultimately, what happens is that you become a person who starts to feel very discouraged and very disappointed. You feel like a failure because when bad things happen, you really couldn't stop it. What often happens is that you even blame the other people around you for your failings because you're trying to control the narrative as to what happened. When we try to be in control all the time, we often become victims of burnout, insomnia, and a variety of other health issues that come from being so anxious and stressed out all of the time. One of the best lessons, one of the, 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 the coolest things I learned uh, during this orientation in St. Louis was about what it means to be a coach for my mentee. Coaching is different from, from being a teacher or, or any other thing. Coaching, a professional coach, is someone who doesn't tell the mentee what to do. We don't control the mentee. Instead, we let that person think about solutions to their problems. We let them problem solve and see if they can come to some solutions. We let them listen to that voice of God in their ear rather than just listening to us telling them to do everything. When we acknowledge that God is in charge, we start listening for that message from heaven from him. We start listening to God say, do not lay a hand on the boy. We start listening and understanding that it is not you and me in charge. It is God who is in charge. So do not lay a hand on the boy. It tells us what God is like. He is a God who is omnipotent, a God who is all-powerful, almighty. He is in complete control. He is the one who makes all things work and hold together. The second thing that uh, the lady had shared with me that she hears when God says, do not lay a hand on the boy. She says that tells her God is like the father. God is the father. God is the father who gives and sacrifices his son. God is the Father who sacrifices his one and only Son for us, not Abraham who has to sacrifice his Son for God. Instead, God, the Father, gives his Son and lets Isaac go. He lets Isaac live. And all of us, through Isaac, who believe in Jesus Christ our Lord, live and be promised not to perish but have what? everlasting life. Amen. This is the God the Father. God the Father is different from all the other gods in the world. I spoke to one of our college students here, Demeric, and I asked him this question, and he said, yeah, he thinks of God the Father, but he's a God who doesn't demand that you sacrifice your children like so 
many pre-Columbian cultures of Central and South America, like the Mayans and the Incans. They had to bring their children and kill them to appease an angry God. But God, the Father, gives his own son to assuage his wrath and give us forgiveness and atonement for our sins and that promise of paradise. To understand, do not lay a hand on the boy, means God is the Father, means that we know that he's in charge. It means that we know that we have that promise, that God is not going to lay a hand on us, but instead save us and give us life. You know, as I think of the Kraken then, I imagine that that was what it was like for God the Father to put his son on the cross. See, the word Kraken, which is kind of interesting, actually is derived from an old Norse word, which means like a tangly, gnarly, twisted, and rugged tree. I guess that's what it would have looked, a, a octopus or a giant squid would have looked like to Scandinavian seafarers. Well, church, it was a rugged, gnarly tree, a cross where Jesus was crucified. It was a rugged cross, a tree where Jesus was killed. But it was this rugged cross where God gives us life. For God to have his son on that cross is for God the Father himself to be in that cross. Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in Jesus. They are on the cross. They are in that place where they can be killed so that you and I can live. So as I'm on this ride, the Kraken, with my daughter, as we have dropped 13 stories, as we've gone over those camelbacks, as we went into that loop, we came to the place where we had to go through those two vertical circles that get up to about 114 feet high and loop around. So as we're going through this loop and we're coming down right where the Disney ride would probably stop and, and ride itself, this ride keeps going. And I can feel the G-forces pulling in my leg, and then I hear my daughter murmur, Papa. <laughs> and then she goes completely quiet. And then I say to myself, oh no, I've just killed my daughter. <laughs> God had just let his son be killed. Oh no. But on the third day, it was, oh yes, as Jesus rises from the dead and shows that God the Father has the power to bring us all back to life again as we have faith in this Jesus who was sacrificed so that we could have life. God goes through, goes up to Moriah's, goes to those places where we can be killed so that as Jesus dies, we have everlasting life. So when God says, do not lay a hand on the boy, he's talking about us. He's talking about how he speaks about us because Jesus had hands laid on him when he was seized and crucified so that you would be let free let free from sin, let free from the devil, let free from death as children of Abraham, children of God, our Father. God is in charge. God is the Father. But for this woman, the third thing that she understood about God from hearing him say, do not lay a hand on the boy, is that God is our protector. Amen? God protects. Now listen to this. God protects, but he does not overprotect like we helicopter parents. God actually manages our risks. 
God allows for Adam and Eve to walk through a garden where there be trees that will cause us to die if we eat from them and serpents with venom. God allows for us to wander a world of thorns and thistles. He allows for us to wander among the offspring of the serpent who will bruise our heel. But it isn't a bulldozer, God, who takes away all of the hazards, but instead he allows for us to learn some things while we're there in it. The Apostle Paul talks about how God lets the trespass increase. As the trespass increases, as we stumble, as we fall, as we make mistakes, God is teaching us something about His grace, the enormity of it, how much He's willing to forgive us for how much ever we do. God is right there to protect us and to save us. God manages our risks so that we learn what kind of God He is, what He is really like, a God who protects us. It's more like this. And I appreciated uh, Principal Root talking about um, how there's a thing that they were working on with the teachers, understanding the difference between risks and threats. So risks are things that you know, kids might just kind of wander into in daily life. I mean, they get on a sliding board, they have to walk up. Can they fall down? Yeah. Can they, can they you know, get some scrapes and bruises? Yeah. But we let them explore and experience those things so that they learn from it. So, so God um, does the same thing for us. Imagine a dad teaching his son how to skate. Now, he knows the kid's going to fall down and learning to skate, going to get banged up a little bit, going to get scratched up. But the father allows for the child to learn, but he gives the child a helmet, gives the child some wrist guards and some elbow guards and some knee guards to prevent more serious injury. Well, are you all familiar with what Paul said about the armor of God? You know where I'm going with this, right? Amen? God prepares us for the serpent. He prepares us for this devil who will try to kill us. God gives us his armor. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians about this belt buckle of truth that's around our waist and a breastplate of righteousness, but then also a helmet of salvation. But then we also get a shield, right? A shield of faith that extinguishes it extinguishes the fiery darts of the devil. But then he gives us a sword. Not a sword so much for slashing, but a sword for parrying and defending ourselves. This sword is the sword of the Spirit. Paul explains that sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The Word of God is, what, is what's spoken from heaven to Abraham. Do not lay a hand on the boy. The Word of God reminds us that God is here not to condemn the world, but to save the world through faith in Jesus Christ. That same Word of God teaches us not to go out and condemn people of the world, but to also bring the saving message of Christ to them so that they also will have eternal life. Amen? As we hear this Word, as we receive that sword of God's word and his spirit, then we are encouraged. We are reassured that God is in charge, that he's our father, and he's the one who protects us. You receive the sword of God's word whenever you come into worship and hear it proclaimed and preached and read and shared with you. You are armed with this sword whenever you are in Bible study. You also carry this sword whenever you read the Bible, the scriptures yourself. God is giving you this sword so that you will know that God has given you all the protection that you need in this world and that he will not lay a hand on you but give you everlasting life. God, today, as we hear him telling us, do not lay a hand on the boy, is telling us all these things about himself and even more. He's reminding us and reassuring us that he's in charge. As we know that God is in charge, then we find ourselves suddenly a lot less like a micromanager. We find ourselves a lot less like a controlling spouse. We find ourselves a lot less like a helicopter or a bulldozer parent. 
we find ourselves not burning out, but encouraged and strengthened. We find that we have a better self-esteem. We don't blame others, but we receive others to help us with life and the challenges that are before us. We are healthier knowing that God is in charge. He's our Father and that He protects us. All of this armor, all of these guards, God has given you as the one who protects you in this world through His Word. So as that ride, the Kraken, comes to an end and we reach the loading platform and I'm worried about my daughter. And as I step out, she steps out with me onto the platform. She's in a daze, and she also looks frazzled, but she's got a smile on her face. So I go, oh, thank you. I have not killed my child. I have not permanently traumatized her. But instead, we have gone through something together in life, something where she can remember that whatever the situation, wherever we are in the world, we have a God who, even in the risk that we face, is who's there, who's in charge. He's a father who gives us life. He's a father who's there to protect us by giving us his armor and his word by which we can hear and know. So often for us as people, well, we want to be in charge. We want to have a steering wheel on that ride, the crack and ride, and we want to turn it and steer it and, and stomp on the brakes, right? But what fun is that? So God is the one who's in charge. He's the one who's guiding that roller coaster. He's the one who's with us in it. He is the Father who restores us to life. He is the Father who gives us all the protection that we need. He is the Father who says to all of us, do not lay a hand on my people or my children because I, through Jesus Christ, have given them everlasting life. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.